Hi guys, welcome to our Thursday night demo. I feel like I should be quoting from Hamlet here over my boiling cauldron. Um, tonight we're making blood orange marmalade with my big brother Jonathan Edgerton, who is the gentleman farmer in Maine on um, Instagram and Facebook. And I'm just going to give you a couple updates. We have some upcoming fun things. Next week we're doing our first virtual wine tasting on Tuesday. That's going to be with Austrian wines um, with Joel and Mike at 5 p.m. And we're doing that live just like this, but it's going to be on Tuesday, not Thursday. Thursday, I'm going to be making um, croissants from scratch. It's a big commitment time-wise, but it's really easy to make them, um, and they go great with fresh homemade uh, blood orange marmalade. And then Pi Day is 3.14, which is Sunday the 14th of March, and we'll be doing 15% off anything that's pie related that's not already on sale. So that can include pizza stuff or regular pie plates, pie servers, pie weights, anything that has to do with pie. So make sure you ask for that and that's Sunday, March 14th. And John, let's make some marmalade. That is fabulous, let's do it. Uh, so we're making blood orange marmalade today. And because the whole process takes about three hours uh, and we didn't want to try to keep you glued to the screen for three hours, uh, we've actually got three different batches in different stages. Um, so Louisa's got the one batch that we started a couple of hours ago and we'll come to that one uh, when it's time for jarring. We've got one that's been simmering for a bit, uh, but we're going to go back to the very beginning. And so uh, the recipe's posted uh, on the website and we're going to do a half batch this time so that we don't end up with three full batches, which would be more than marmalade than anybody here could eat, I think, for a while. So. Um, so a half batch is going to be one lemon uh, and four blood oranges. Um, and so we're going to start with a piece of cheesecloth, which sounds like an unlikely thing to do. And we're going to put that right in there. Um, oranges and lemons, citrus fruits have a fair amount of pectin in them. And there's a lot of flavor in the pith and stuff, but we don't want to eat all that. So we're going to try to make sure that we get the use of it. So we're going to start by cutting all four of these oranges straight across and we're going to do the same thing with a lemon what is it that you like about blood oranges uh you know i think it's they seem exotic because when we were kids they weren't around and you know you travel places you go to your go to the mediterranean or something and they had these brightly colored oranges and uh, so for me, I think it's more that they seem exotic. Plus, when the jam is done, the marmalade's done, you'll see the color of them. It's yeah, really fantastic. It's a beautiful kind of rosy pink. Yeah, it's a, it's a great color. And they've got a little, little different flavor. Um, so I'm going to juice these just kind of roughly into here. And you'll see that I'm doing them into a strainer over the bowl. What we're going to do is separate out the juice, but we're going to want to keep all the, the pith and the pulp and things like that. So I'll kind of zip through these as quickly as we can without spraying too much all over myself. You'll see that I picked a shirt that has appropriate marmalade colored stripes in it for today's. And so. they will dye your hands. I um, did not wear gloves earlier. My hands are kind of beet colored or blood orange colored, if you will. That'll, uh, that'll suit you well when you go to your night job working in the butcher shop. So. <laughs> That's not really my night job. Oh. Very older brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of other things. Most most of the uh, most of the inappropriate pranks have been worked out at this point, so we don't really have to worry about those. Uh, so we're just trying to get. You don't have to get all the juice out of here, but you want to get as much as you can so when, within reason. When we made this first batch, I got from eight oranges, which is what the recipe calls for. I got about two. Eight oranges and two lemons, I get about two cups of really beautiful juice out of it. And that's about normal, right? That's about yeah, what you're looking sounds, for. Sounds about right. You know, yeah. I've never actually sat down and, and measured the yeah. the juice from it, but yeah. And these are really good. beautifully juicy oranges. Yeah, they're good they're good and ripe. So we're gonna do the, the lemons too, and the lemons just add some acidity. The oranges themselves, uh, because they're so ripe, they tend to be very sweet. A little extra acid isn't a bad thing here. All right, so we're getting most of the way through those. 
So for that first part, I'm just going to let that set and drip through a little bit. Um, what we're going to do now is we are going to try to save all the, uh, like I say, all the bits of membrane and uh, other pieces, seeds and stuff that we don't necessarily want to have in the marmalade that we're going to eat. We're going to want to extract that, uh, the flavor and pectin and stuff out of them. So really what we're making is kind of like a giant tea bag with this uh, muslin or cheesecloth here so we can get all that. I'm going to cut these guys in half again. Trying not to remove any fingers. Jonathan, what is pectin? Pectin? Uh, pectin is a compound contained primarily in the skins, I think, of fruits. Different fruits have different amounts. This guy can probably shut down. Um, and it, that's what makes things gel. So apples have a lot of pectin in them. Um, some people make their marmalade without using adding pectin, but uh, over the years I've had a few batches of jams and jellies that didn't set, so maybe I'm not as much of a risk taker as I thought I was. So I'm taking a good sharp spoon. You can see it's got a sharp edge on it. And what I'm doing is scraping all of the membrane and some of the pith. You don't have to be very meticulous with this. Just trying to scrape some of that out. And again, How you want to save the you. flavor. Very, very pithy. So, and again, as the blood oranges get older and riper, the skins get thinner. And so it becomes a little more difficult if they were younger ones, kind of like you can see with that lemon, it's got a little bit of green on it. And you can see how thick the, the pith is on the outside of it. Does it make a difference to the marmalade, whether you have the older or do you want the thinner? skin is that better do you think? I, I don't think it matters a whole lot. Um, if you had the thicker skin you'd be trying to scrape more of the pith away. Um, or also kind of the little green button stems. Pop those off if you can. This I found that this when I did this first batch this was the part that took the longest out of the whole process besides waiting for stuff to boil and simmer and so on but this is really the the time it, consuming it takes a, bit. a little bit more time, yeah. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you on that. And, not, you know, sometimes when you buy blood oranges, you'll notice sometimes they're, you know, fairly pale and orangey. These are really unusually dark, some of them. Hence the staining of our hands. So, we got through half these. So, yeah, just bear with me as I get through the rest of these. That one worked well. The trick is to kind of get into the middle of the pith with a sharp edged spoon and it tends to come out a little more easily at that point. Do you find that um, blood oranges are sweeter than regular ones or do they have a different kind of flavor do you think? A different? Yeah, I, th I think there's a, a subtle difference in flavor. I think I think they do tend to be sweeter. If you go to Italy and you get a glass of orange juice, usually it's made from blood oranges. Oh, really? Yeah, and so you'd be surprised the first time you go to get a glass of get orange juice pink. and find it's a, a deep, rich, orangey red. So are they mostly grown in Italy? Uh, well, these ones are domestic, I'm sure. Um, I think the reason that we didn't have them around here in the grocery store until maybe the last five years or so is because they probably weren't grown as much in the U.S. And then, as with so many things, our taste broaden and then the market responds to that. Right. All right, a couple more here. So that is all the pith, the seeds, the orange peels, the pulp from, from juicing, all of that stuff is going in the cheesecloth tea bag. Yep, absolutely. So I think we've got most of that in there. And so now, oh, one more. One more. If you can kill the heat on this one here. Boil that anymore. Wrong one. No, that was the right one. All right. 
I got through that. Now we've got our stack and we're going to try to cut these neatly. Um, so I would say between an eighth and a quarter of an inch, a little bigger than a wooden matchstick. Um, and there's no requirement that you do it that way. I just kind of like that in terms of marmalade. Um, if you, if you buy marmalade, sometimes particularly British marmalade, you might see that it's labeled fine cut or things like that. And again, that all has to do with how wide the, uh, the rind bits are. So all of that is going to go into a pot. Yep. We're going to throw these into the big kettle. Um, get through these as quickly as we can. And rinds obviously are tough. You wouldn't want to eat them in their current condition. And so as you see the one that you've got over there, those simmered for two hours. Um, you don't necessarily have to do them for two hours. You probably do it for a little bit less. Um, the real test is uh, making sure that they're good and tender. So the timing on this is not precise. It doesn't have to be two hours um, of simmering necessarily, but you want to aim for around that amount of time? Yeah, an hour and a half okay. may be adequate. But yeah, I, this there are some things that you make where you have to be very precise. This is one of those things you can, uh, you can bend the rules. And I mean, we're using blood oranges. Um, you could make lime marmalade. I'd love to try a batch of lime marmalade. Um, I bought lemon marmalade before. Um, grapefruit. Grapefruit is really popular with some people. Uh, just about any of those things. Tangerines. Any kind of citrus. Yep. And then, so the, the batch that we're going to move on to, well, actually, both of these batches have reduced about half. Is that typical? Yeah, you know, we, we, uh, the recipe calls for a half gallon of water. Um, and you can top that up a little bit if it boils. I mean, the, really, if they're simmering, you'll lose a little bit. You may not lose a lot, so you might want to use your your judgment, such as it is to um, to add a little bit of liquid in there. And, um, and a lot of that ends up really, you know, the flavor becomes more concentrated as the water boils away. Um, but you get the same volume of peel, so it's really probably more an issue of the ratio of peel. Got it. So then you can just add a little bit more water if you need to. Yep. Yeah, if you sense a lot of it, a lot of it is boiled away, um, there's no reason not to add a little bit into there. Um, you do want some of it to evaporate uh, because that's where it gets a lot of the concentration of the flavor. All right, I'm just about done with these guys here. And we don't actually have a pot for these ones. <laughs> we don't. We'll be okay. doing this. We'll do another batch tomorrow. Yeah, so what we do is we'll do that and we'll, we'll tie this off too just for the sake of showing what's everybody. So you, it's probably about a 12 to 15 inch square of this and just going to wrap that up. And that our, is just to keep that stuff from becoming part of the... Yeah, you don't you actually want the flavor, wanna, but not the, the bits. Exactly. Tea bag is probably the best analogy I can provide for this. So we're just going to tie this off. And you'll see in just a second the one that we pulled out of the other batch. So I'm going to set that one aside as well. Perfect. So those go into a pot with... Well, yep. normally you do eight oranges, two lemons, and it would go into a pot with um, eight cups of water. Uh, half gallon. Half eight gallon. Cups, eight cups of water. Yep. Um, and along with the juice that the you've juice. juiced. Yep. And so, yeah. So within it, it's all these items here. And you would simmer that for about an hour and a half to two hours till the peels are nice and tender. And you can kind of tell by cutting them with a spoon. So... We're through the go magic to, of television. Through the magic of television. Um, so we've got this batch here, which again is a half batch, which is exactly what we would have made with that. And it has simmered for its allotted time. The peel, you can kind of cut with a spoon or you can take a piece out and nibble away at it. 
So I'm just going to try to extract as much juice out of this as we can without bursting open the bag and getting all the undesirables in there. So we're going to take that. And that whole thing is going to go into our compost. Yep, that'll get composted. Because the cheesecloth is just cotton, so that will... So this volume's gone down. I'm going to actually give this just a little bit of water just to bring that up a little bit. Just based on my gut. And now we put what appears to be an unconscionable amount of sugar in here. Um, so for a full batch would be four pounds, so this is two pounds of sugar here. If you want to come over and kind of redo the heat under that one and, oh actually we're going to put the pectin in first. So if we're doing a full batch, um, we would use a full bag of pectin. Uh, we're doing a half batch, so I'm going to do my best to put just about half of this in there. As you stir, you, what you don't want is for this to clump up, which it will do. Yeah, it's about half. It's a family thing, this measuring, the way we measure. Neatly measured, carefully Neatly, measured. very accurately by eye. All right. Get that going. Sugar. In goes the sugar. Two pounds of sugar. Woo! All right. Yeah. Uh, let's do this let's so we do don't get tangled up in our in our uh, microphone wires here. You can there have you that. Go. I'll take Push that. Push these things off to the side. All righty. So this is just pectin. So this, you can see the difference. These, you can still see some of the pith on there. You can see where it's whitish. And this is going to cook just a little bit longer. These guys have been cooking ready. and boiling just beautifully. Yep. So you can see they're a little bit thinner. A lot of the, the pith has boiled off of those. Yep, that looks perfect. All right, love that. So what's the next step? Put Canning. them in jars? Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of people um, are intimidated. Actually, where's the paper towels? You grab me a couple of those. I think a lot of people are intimidated by canning, and I know I used to be, um, if it's something you don't do regularly. Um, but like so many other things, once you do it a few times, it really becomes, um, you just get more comfortable with it. And uh, I'm not going to say that there aren't uh, risks involved in terms of having something mold, but if you follow the basic steps, um, I don't know, I've probably made 20 or 30, 40 jars, uh, batches of jams and jellies over the year, and I don't think I've ever had a jar go moldy or the seal fail on it. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty reliable if you uh, pay attention to the basic issues of hygiene and things like that. So It's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. People have been doing it for years. So what we've got is some jars that um, we left in boiling water for a little bit. Um, and really what you're trying to do is kill any mold, bacteria, or fungus that may be growing in them. And you can see, um, as you may know, when, uh, when you boil a solution, it's got all the sugar and stuff in there. It boils at something higher than the usual 212 degrees. So, we're gonna so there's not much living in the off. jam itself. It's more, we're concerned about making sure the jars and the lids are not contaminated. Yep, they're good and clean. And then once we put this in there, we're going to drop it in the boiling water bath. So this is something to be fairly cautious with, just because this is so hot. Um, try not to burn your fingers. I pick the jars up. A lot of people prefer not to. There's also, um, right down front here, Oh, do you have the, um, uh, we have a, a funnel which will fit a lot of different sizes of jars, which also might um, help to not boil. Plus, you have asbestos fingers. Most people probably wouldn't be able to hold that jar. There is that asbestos. Back when so, asbestos was a good thing. Um, so when we were kids and mummy would make jam, she would use paraffin wax yep, on the top. instead of canning, instead of boiling them. Right? Yep. Or would she still, she wouldn't boil them. She'd just use that. And that would I think do she'd, the, she'd sanitize the jars, but right. instead of putting uh, metal tops on them, she'd 
make sure they were clean and then pour in melted paraffin on top, which would sit on top because it's and that lighter than water and it would seal them up that way. It does the same thing. Yeah. And one of the things you want to pay attention to as you're filling these is um, the uh, sections of peel tend to float on top in here and you'll see they're floating on the top in there. You want to try to get it even as you're putting it in here, otherwise you will get to the end of filling your jars and you'll have um, very little peel to go into the into the last few. So, and, and you're filling those pretty full. Uh, I think the guideline is about a quarter of an inch, and so you leave it down a quarter, maybe three eighths of an inch. What ends up happening, and we'll talk about this when we put it into the boiling water, is that that air that's in that top little space uh, gets hot. It's already going to be hot, but it gets hot when it goes in the hot water bath. And then as you take the jar out and you've got the cover on there, that air basically shrinks as it cools off. Um, and that's what forms that kind of vacuum seal that you get. So anytime you buy a jar of something and it's been preserved like that, it's got a little vacuum seal. That's the reason it's got that is because that airspace has essentially shrunk. So we'll start just based on these first six here. Do you have to do it while it's still hot? Could you let it cool? Could you wait and do it the next day? No, I think you, again, what you're trying to do is make sure there is nothing living inside your little jars there. No mold, no fungus, no bacteria. Um, and so you want to do everything and get them sealed up as quickly as possible. So we're just going to, because we want this, these covers to seat well on top here, we're Aaron just going to rub wet. a... That might help. Oh yeah. This damp is better. Um, so we're just going to gently wipe these with a damp cloth. And again, just enough to make sure that the very top rim is clean and that there's nothing that's going to break that seal between the top of the glass and the gasket on the covers. And how long will these last once they're canned? Uh, like this. I have jelly in the cellar that I open that's a couple of years old. Grape jellies from two Still to three great, years ago. Good flavor and good. Yep. Yeah, I think I think a, probably a good rule of thumb is to is to go with a year. Um, but like I say, I've I've kept jams and jellies, and I think some of it depends on um, what you're canning. Some things are more prone to certain things like botulism and and yes. so on. The other food foodborne illnesses. And do you keep it, you store it in a cool, dry, dark spot, or does it matter where you store it? Uh, you got it exactly. Cool, dry, and dark is good. Because that also keeps things from growing. Yeah, exactly. So we're not going super tight on these, um, again, because we want uh, some of that air is going to have to, as it expands and goes into the boiling water bath, you want to make sure that the boiling water, they say, is an inch or so above the top. Again, handy dandy tongs here. We're going to set these into the boiling water bath. Do you want more water in there? Uh, I think the as we put more in, oh, it's yep. going to displace water. And so even though it's not over the top of the first one, it will be up over the top of the others. My brother is also known as Archimedes. He discovered water displacement. Eureka. So we're going to put those in there. Um, what I've read is that if you're making clear jellies, that five minutes is adequate. If you're making jams and things with chunks of fruit and so on, they suggest that you go for 10 minutes. I'm not sure why the distinction. It's all been um, boiling in here, but um, we'll give them 10 minutes or so. Awesome. So while we're waiting for those, um, tell us about the gentleman farmer in Maine. Uh, yeah, so the gentleman farmer in Maine, I, people who know me know that I worked, I had a, another career, another life for uh, about 35 years as a consultant, and I'm still dabbling in that, but I'm semi-retired, and that gives me an opportunity to do some of the other things that I've enjoyed doing and wanted to do. Uh, a lot of it relates to food and travel and growing things, and we've got what we call a gentleman's farm up in Bowdoin, and uh, it's really kind of a a lifestyle thing. Um, what we find is that like making marmalade or uh, some of the meat curing and other things, 
a lot of that stuff isn't really terribly difficult. It, you really just have to try it and learn a little bit about it. And um, I think what we're trying to do is inspire other people to try these things and to do them uh, because it's really rewarding. Um, and success breeds success. You try a few things and they work out well. It uh, encourages you to try other things. And uh, we're just having a, an awful lot of fun. We're happy to share recipes and advice. And, um, you know, we're, we're never going to be better cheese makers than the artisan cheese makers that are out there. We're never going to be, um, you know, better chefs than some of the chefs, better bakers than the people who specialize in bread. But that doesn't mean you can't tackle these things and do them and uh, and do them well and, and feel good about it. It's very, very satisfying. And we want other people to have those same experiences. That's cool. Make it look, you make it look easy. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Um, so those are going to boil for ten more for about ten minutes total. Yep, and then, and then we'll take them out. we'll put another batch in. Yep, um, and then when we take these out, put them upside down. Yeah, so we so that that's one of the uh, one of the factors here. So what you're going to see, as I talked about, is that the um, is that the peels tend to rise to the top. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? That. Yeah, lovely color to this stuff. Um, so we give them another couple minutes. Uh, but what happens is that all rises um, because it's less dense than the rest of the jelly. And so not when it first comes out, we'll wait till the they shrink and the covers pop down. You'll hear a popping sound as that air contracts and, um, and the covers are made not flat. They're made so that they're tipped up a little bit this way. They'll tip down and go pop um, when they cool. And after they've cooled a little bit, we'll invert them so that, that uh, the marmalade, the peel, tends to get more uniformly distributed. Otherwise, the first three people who put marmalade on their toast are going to get all the peel, and everybody else is going to get just uh, blood orange jelly, which may not be a bad thing, but it's not what it's, it's, not the same. Not what it's supposed to be. Not the same. Cool. Well, thank you, Jonathan. This has been really fun. I have enjoyed being able to be the assistant because this is something that I've always been really kind of nervous about doing all the canning and stuff. I've made marmalade, but then I've just put it in jars and given it away and said, eat this now. Um, so that is really cool. Um, just a reminder that we have next Tuesday, we have Austrian wines with Joel and Mike at five o'clock live on Facebook. We also are offering a wine tasting price on the three wines that we are offering. Um, and I don't have that here, so you'll need to look on our website to get those wines. But if you come in between uh, March 5th and for the next, I think, week, um, we will sell those three wines at a lower pr price so you can taste them right along with Mike and Joel. And then next Thursday, we're doing the croissants or croissant. Um, and again, that's going to be one you're going to want to watch it and then start making your own because we're going to have to do it in stages like we did with tonight because it just takes too long. Um, and then Pie Day on March 14th, 3.14, and that's 15% off all pie related and pizza related items. And I think that's it. And thank you so much for joining us, John. This has been awesome. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Let's yeah. see if we can get this guy to pop down. Oh, no, he's not shrunk not yet. yet. Not cooled enough yet. I was hoping it would, but yeah. Anyway, we'll get some pictures for you to add on to, um, to that we'll post later once we have some of it done. Thanks a lot, everybody. See you next week. See ya.